In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Today, let us consider how the kingdom of heaven comes to man, particularly how it comes to man through the means of prayer. Faithful daily prayer prepares a man for entry into the kingdom of heaven by establishing that same kingdom firmly in his heart. Now, some might say, well, isn't the reception of the sacraments more important than prayer, than personal prayer? Well, yes and no. Objectively, obviously, the sacraments being the complete agency of God, yes, in that sense, they are more important, but it's prayer, the habit of prayer, that prepares us to receive those sacraments well. If we aren't prepared to receive them well, we won't benefit much from them. So we need prayer to do that. There's no replacement for daily personal prayer. It's a necessity for growth in the spiritual life, if not, as I said, for the worthy reception of the sacraments or for entry into heaven. St. John Vianney says that prayer is absolutely necessary for salvation. Consider the two parables we are given today as good instances, good examples of what prayer is, of how to pray, and of what the great effects of prayer can be. In both of the parables, the rain of heaven comes in from the outside, but it finds something well prepared. In the case of the mustard seed, it finds soil that's well prepared, in the case of the leaven, the yeast, it finds the, the, well, uh, the milled flour. In the first case, it creates a tree that reaches up to heaven. In the other, the entire mass of the dough is leavened, lightened. Another parable, if you read the Gospel of Matthew, is recounted just before these, the parable of the sower. It's good that this comes before because we see that for, even for that little mustard seed to take root, the soil has to be prepared. You know from that other parable, different kinds of soil are hard and don't admit any entrance, or they're rocky, or they have weeds all through them. And if that's the case, then the mustard seed doesn't stand much of a chance. And so this gives us a direction for how to prepare ourselves, how to begin our prayer. When we sit down to pray, to make our personal prayer to God... It's good for us to clear aside all the rubble, clear aside those little stones and those those little weeds that have propped up in our soul, get them out of the way. Say, well, all right, well, how do I do that? How do I create this healthy soil in our soul, the space for God to enter in? First is just taking the time. Let's take time every day. Let's take time. I would say, hopefully, at least 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes. And then, I believe it is a good practice to spend the first part, part, no more than a third, I would say, sort of airing, for the airing of the grievances. There's a certain way of recognizing where those stones are, where those little brambles are, pointing them out, putting them out to God. This guy's really bugging me. I can't stop thinking about him. Just driving me crazy. Right? So get that out there. Point to the rock and say, okay. Well, you know what? I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to put it over here for now, outside of my view. It's still there. I'll come back to it later, I'm sure. But we'll just take them out. Take them out of our view. All your daily concerns, all the obligations you have of your life, they will still be there after your prayer. Recognize them. This is weighing on my heart. I can't stop thinking about this. Why do I keep doing this? Even your own personal feelings. Why do I keep doing this? Okay, got it out there. Take it up, move it to the side. Clear the ground, clear that space. So we do that. If we do this, we prepare a healthy ground, and God will take care of the rest. In the place of that stone of that weed, that's where He will put that mustard seed. That's where He will plant in our heart this tree that reaches up to heaven. We need this, and we need to take that time, for, especially for personal prayer, because the concerns of our life 
pulls us down, and they pull us down to that horizontal plane. Um, they pull us down to think about all these other things that are going all around about us. And if we keep our heads pointed down on the earth, pointed to these things, then we grow, we grow like a vine that doesn't have anything to grow on, like a bramble, you know, like some ivy out there. It just grows along the ground and it kind of wanders here and there. And the longer it stays down there, the further it gets off course. The longer we stay focused on the things of the world, even if our concerns are big and very important, the longer we stay focused just on them, the more likely we are to get off course. And we keep going forwards, pushing, 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 ever faster, forwards. But if we're going off course, we're just going It's going the wrong direction. We're getting further and further away. So we need that prayer to look up. To look up, to look away from the things of earth. To look up to God. That's what we see in that mustard tree. It reaches up. It reaches up to heaven. It spreads its limbs out up to heaven. Up to the heavens. That's what God will put in our souls if we give Him that chance. If we take that time and get rid of those little concerns, get that silence and that space for him to put that seed into our heart, we'll reach up to heaven, we'll contemplate God, we'll become more grounded in the things of heaven than the things on earth. And when we do that, we get a great assistance too. It says uh, the translation is like the birds of the air, but it's really the birds of heaven. Birds of heaven, winged creatures from heaven, come and alight in that tree. Who are that but the angels? The angels who spend their entire lives, their, their whole existence, contemplating the face of God, completely directed to God, even though, for our guardian angels, they're also directed down to us, to helping us. So we take them kind of as our model. I say we ought to do this, even if it means putting aside the concern of our own sins. They'll still be there. We don't just ignore them all the time. But we need that time put them aside, to focus just on God, just to contemplate God, his goodness, his providence, his power, his justice, his mercy. Again, when we do this, we imitate the angels and we ground ourselves in the things that never change. This does a couple of things. Objectively, it just gives God that opening to tell us something. You know, if we're always going on and on and on, God can't get a word in edgewise. And it's rare, it happens, he'll knock you know, someone off their horse or something, but for the most part, he's just going to sit there and wait for us to shut up. But so we need to do that, so that he can reach into us and say, hey, do this or don't do that. But more important, or equally important, Subjectively, again, it orders us to God. It, it or reorients us back to God. So we aren't completely ordered to the things of the earth, to created things. Over the order to God, and that we meditate on that, on his great virtues, and that that becomes our template. That becomes our pattern. That becomes our lodestone. And this, then, affects how we see everything else. We, we then turn around and see what, how small the things are that we were concerned with. Spend time focusing on God and the eternal. We've got to recognize how light and unimportant these temporal things are. Oh, this guy doesn't like me. Huh. Why? Who cares? Right? When I've been looking at God, I've been focused on God, and God's love for me, the fact that one man out there doesn't like me, okay, big whoop, right? A minute ago, that was consuming me. Now doesn't really seem to matter. You're angry about an injustice. You look at the great justice of God, the providence, the plan that he has for everything that encompasses the whole of creation, which nothing can escape. Turn around and you say, oh, well, I guess this little injustice isn't that bad. Do we delight in created things? Delight more in God. We wish to love and be loved by others. See God's complete and unmatchable love for you. Again, we have to take that time and remember. Remember what we've always known, but give ourselves that opportunity to really see it. To see God's love for us. 
We really see that. And again, we won't, we won't be so keen to pursue someone else's love of us in the wrong way, or the wrong, using wrong means. This accomplishes what St. Paul speaks of in our epistle today. He says, we have turned from, uh, to God from idols. In Latin, the word is simulacris, which is a, a literal translation of the Greek, which means images, simulations. It's a little bit better word than idols, because we can see that all of the created things, all of our concerns, all those little rocks that were impeding our path and clogging up our soul, they're just images, they're just shadows, they're temporary. Everything on this earth is temporary. And we turn from those in prayer to focus on God who is permanent, the only permanent thing, the one in whom we find our own permanence. We look up to heaven, we find our true home. At the same time, we can look to the other parable to see that we must not expect instant results from our prayer or that every time we sit down to pray, it's going to be sort of magical and life-changing and uh, fireworks and all that. Because that's why our Lord gives us this second parable, or a reason why he gives us this second parable, shows us that his action works like leaven, works like yeast going into dough, which doesn't happen instantly. It, takes, it goes through the whole dough, but it goes in a hidden way. Says the woman hid the leaven in the dough. So it happens in a hidden way unseen way most of the time but it spreads out and it spreads out and it spreads out and it lightens the whole thing so again we see what we have to do to prepare beforehand you want to make bread you have to have ground of flour you want to make good bread that flour has to be finely ground so sometimes when we're removing those stones removing those brambles out of the view, or when we're lamenting all the ways we've been beaten down or crushed in this life, it's good to turn and see, wait a minute, God's really been preparing me to pray to him. He's been using these other things, these stones, like millstones in my life, to grind me down, grind me down. That's what contrite means. Contrite means ground down like that. Not ground down in despair, but grinding our own pride down so that we're ready to accept God's yeast, God's leaven. So we, it'll diffuse itself all through our soul. So we always need to come with great humility in prayer, accepting our trials and tribulations as God's work in us as well. And if we do that again, we will have this great benefit that the prayer, our prayer, God will work through our prayer in us to lighten us, to lighten our load. Our soul will rise. It will rise above our cares and concerns of the earth. And then when we come out of our prayer and we say, all right, I'm going to go pick up those, you know, I put the rocks and the brambles aside and now it's time to return to my daily life. Well, a lot of times you'll find that space where they had been has been filled in. They aren't as heavy anymore. Your soul is lighter. They're easier to carry. You realize you don't have to carry this thing at all. It's just disappeared. These are the great, these are the great results. These are the great effects that we have um, from prayer. From making that commitment to daily and to personal prayer too. Personal prayer. Devotions are excellent, of course. But there's nothing that can replace that personal prayer with God. Now, you may be saying, it sounds nice, Father, but I don't have time to pray. Now, unless you are a single mother with small children or the equivalent, I believe everyone can find the time. And even if you can't find that 15 minutes continuously, you can always find time to pray throughout the day. Little prayers. When you're sitting in traffic, not doing anything. All those times, it's a great example, all those times when people pull out their phones pull out their phones when there's a moment's, a moment's hesitation, a moment's gap. Pull out the phone, check their email, check their, you know, whatever. Well, pull out your prayer. 
Sitting in the, you're sitting in the grocery line. Hmm, I don't want to look at that magazine. I'm going to pray. And ask for help. You have a family, ask for help. Moms, ask dad. Hey, I need you to take the kids so I can pray. And dads, pray before you get home from work. The rise will thank you for it. Say, hey, honey, I'm going, to be, I'm, going to, I'm going to come home 15 minutes late. I've got to sort some stuff out first. Thank you. Thank you. Do that. Yeah, exactly. Now you say, what if you stay? Oh, there's still not enough time. You're asking too much. Let's hear what St. John Vianney has to say about that. He says, What then should we think of those lukewarm Christians who say they have no time to pray? No time to pray. Poor, deluded beings. What is of more value? To try to please God and save your soul? or to do your daily share of toil. No time to pray? Suppose God had let you die during the night. Would you do your work today? Or if God had sent you a protracted sickness, would you then be able to perform your daily labor? Oh, what blindness! Such people deserve that God should let them perish in their blindness. We deem it sufficient to devote a few moments to him, to thank him for the graces which we receive from him every moment of our lives. You say you are too busy, but do not forget, my friends, that your principal business in this life is to please God and to save your soul. If you do not attend to your work yourself, somebody else will take your place and do it. But if you lose your soul, Who will save it for you? Finally, just a small note, a little inspiration maybe to pray a little more coming in. Prepare yourself for Thanksgiving and the holidays. The time when you need to be holding on to what is eternal and unchanging. Time is most important when you're surrounded by things that are flowing around you. Um, those old relationships that provoke, un, uh, that provoke forgotten grievances and unexpected emotions that come back to you when you see this person, this family member, all these things, all the hustle and the bustle that goes around with Thanksgiving and all the relationships that come out and all these other things, all the arguments and Facebook and etc. This is the time for Thanksgiving, sit down and pray. During Thanksgiving, ground yourself. Say, you know what? Leave this one alone. Don't have to do this right now. It's going to be okay. Ground yourself in prayer, and you can let all that stuff with the holidays kind of flow around you, and you can just pick out the good. Let us close, then, with a prayer to our Blessed Mother, composed by St. Germanus. O my only lady, who art the sole consolation which I receive from God. Thou who art the only celestial dew that doth soothe my pains. Thou who art the light of my soul when it is surrounded with darkness. Thou who art my guide in my journeyings, my strength in my weakness, my treasure in my poverty, balm for my wounds, my consolation in sorrow, Thou who art my refuge in misery, the hope of my salvation, graciously hear my prayer, have pity on me, as is befitting the mother of a God who hath so much love for men. Thou who art our defense and joy, grant me what I ask, make me worthy of enjoying with thee that great happiness which thou dost enjoy in heaven. Yes, my lady, my refuge, my life, my help, my defense, my strength, my joy, my hope, make me to come with thee to paradise. I know that being the mother of God, thou canst obtain this for me if thou wilt. O Mary, thou art omnipotent to save sinners. Thou needest nothing else to recommend us to thee, for thou art the mother of true life. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.